most of you. Times were very hard in the United States with high unemployment and poverty, but they were even worse in Germany. In 1932, the Nazi party in Germany took advantage of this hardship and used it to overthrow the democratic government. The leader of the Nazi party, Adolf Hitler, came to power as a self-proclaimed dictator. He blamed all of Germany's problems on minorities, especially Jews, and began a program to get rid of them. So in 1933, in order to keep his family safe from the Nazis, Anne's father moved his whole family to Amsterdam in Holland. You see where Holland is on the map? It's actually, it actually says the Netherlands, but it's right, the orange part, right next to B. My family stayed in Frankfurt in Germany. My ancestors have lived in that area since the 1800s, and my father felt that the Nazi regime was too extreme to remain in power. As a child in Frankfurt, beginning at age nine, I experienced systematic discrimination and cruel laws against Jews. In 1938, when I was 14 years old, my family became victims during the Kristallnacht. In English, this is known as the Night of Broken Glass. All over Germany, the Nazis smashed and burned Jewish homes, businesses, and synagogues. Has anybody here heard of the Kristallnacht? Great. Okay. Having moved to Holland, Anne Frank was not affected by the Kristallnacht. She did not feel the effects of Hitler's policies until 1940 when Germany invaded Holland. After this time, her life became much worse than mine. Between the ages of 11 and 15, the same age of many of you here today, we both lost our happy, carefree existence, and ultimately, Anne lost her life to the Nazis and the Holocaust. Anne was a wonderful writer and wrote about her hopes for the future, the changing seasons of the chestnut tree outside her window, and her conflicts and emotions with the people she shared her house with. The tree stood as a link between Anne and nature while she hid in the secret annex. In Anne's diary on February 23, 1944, she wrote, as long as this, the tree exists, and it certainly always will, I know that then there will always be comfort for every sorrow, whatever the circumstances may be. You in the Southern Cuyahoga School District are ensuring that the tree will live on as Anne had wished. By 1945, as Mr. Zimfer said, 6.5 million Jewish people, including 1.5 million Jewish children, lost their lives in the Holocaust. Now let me tell you my story. I was born in 1924, the only child of my mother's second marriage. We lived in a beautiful apartment on the top floor of a red sandstone apartment building. There were four flights of circular wooden stairs leading to our apartment. As a child, I often complained to my mother about having to climb them. I had both Jewish and non-Jewish friends in my neighborhood. When I was a young girl, I had a scooter and later a bicycle, which I loved to ride in the park close by. My father was born in a small farming town <coughs> in an area northwest of Frankfurt in Germany. Our ancestors had lived there since the 18th century and had owned a general store in the center of town. My father moved to the city of Frankfurt as an adult. He worked as a wholesale supplier of ladies' hats. He had two big trunks of samples, and I loved to play with them, trying on hats with all kinds of feathers and decorations. My mother was born in Dresden, which is in eastern Germany, and moved to Frankfurt when she was a child. She helped my father with bookkeeping at his office and looked after our home. My mother loved baking, cooking, knitting, and other handicrafts. We were the only Jews in our building. We belonged to a synagogue a few blocks from our house, which I walked to each Saturday morning with my parents. 
My mother was a member of a Jewish women's organization where she made handcrafted, handcrafted items to donate for good causes. Life changed a lot in 1933 when Nazis passed laws prohibiting Jews from practicing professions like law and medicine and Nazi propaganda was posted everywhere. There were long red swastika flags on apartment windows all around where I lived. I was nine years old. By 1935, my parents and I could still walk freely about town or take the streetcar. I had attended a public elementary school with Christian and Jewish children. In 1935, a law was passed forbidding Jewish children from attending public school. From then on, I, I was enrolled at the Jewish high school, which also included middle school. It was a combined school. My five school friends and I still met every day at the corner of my street and walked to the Jewish high school, a 20-minute walk from our home. However, my friends and I stayed away from public places with signs saying, Jews not allowed, such as libraries, cinemas, theaters, museums, swimming pools, and restaurants. We avoided the public demonstrations organized by the Nazis. Most of my school friends and their families were able to emigrate from Germany before it was too late. It was difficult for my parents to find a country where we could immigrate to, as my father was already in his mid-fifties. My parents were worried about learning a language such as English, worried about how to find employment to support us, and thought that they were not skilled for work in any other country. The requirements to emigrate were very difficult. The U.S and most Western countries were not willing to accept more than their quota of Jewish immigrants. To get into the United States, one needed a person living there, such as a relative, to accommodate them for one year so they, so they would not become a burden to their new country. My father registered for the U.S. quota number in 1937, and by that time, the waiting list was already very long. At the same time, the Nazis took away my father's business. Suppliers refused to deal with Jews, and taxes on Jews became extra high. This made life much more difficult in every way. Our hopes were with a relative in the U.S. My father's distant cousin in Connecticut was willing to be a U.S. sponsor and offered very generously for us to live in her home for the required year. Initially, she was worried that she could not afford the cost involved, but eventually agreed to pay our family's expenses and guarantee a $100 deposit. In today's currency, that would be $1,600. Even so, we would still have to wait for our quota number to come up before an emigration could materialize. There would have been many other arrangements to deal with. The worrying, hoping, and sadness in my home was never ending. On November 9, 1938, my parents and I were woken up at 6 in the morning by the doorbell ringing. We were terrified and hardly had time to put on a dressing gown as we heard the sound of boots on the wooden stairs. Three big armed SS Nazis dressed in black uniforms banged hard several times on the glass front door, shouting, Aufmachen! Open up! Nazis stormed about our apartment, taking apart everything, dumping the contents of drawers and taking the pictures off the wall. They took all the valuables out of a safety box which was built into the wall behind the painting. Then they took the silver cutlery, leaving for each of us a set of fork, knife, and soup spoon, one for milk and one for meat. One of the Nazis ordered, pushed, and shouted at my, at my father to hurry and move quickly. There was no time for my father to get properly dressed, and he wore his suit and coat over his pajamas 
his shoes without socks, and no hat. 